speaker <clears throat> is it Ivana. Our next speaker is Ivana Lescano. Her talk is going to be about year-round plasma steroid hormone profiles and reproductive ecology of gopher tortoises. Also, Ivana is a student in the um, student presentation award competition. Ivana. All right, thank you, and good morning. So I did not put tortoises back together, but I am here to show you a little bit about the reproductive ecology. Now, this is work I did at Florida Gulf Coast University for my undergraduate degree, and I'm now at SAU pursuing my master's. All right, so a little bit of background info before we actually get into what we did and what we saw. As we know, exotherms are very closely tied to their environment. Like someone said yesterday, they're essentially solar powered, right? We know that they need to be out in the sun, and they rely heavily on their environment because we know that obviously their metabolism doesn't provide them with enough heat and enough energy for all their bodily processes. So because of that, we see the environment not only playing a critical role in, yes, things like metabolism and digestion, but we also see it in terms of things like reproduction, so you can see right here. And an example I provided for you here today is that of the alligator snapping turtle. Essentially, the hotter the environment during the incubation, you can see here in this graph the shorter the incubation duration. So the environment is playing a crucial role in how long these guys incubated for. And you'll see that last arrow goes to a hatchling because it doesn't just stop there. We see these things actually impact things like hatchling success, hatchling fitness, and then it ends up being very important not only for themselves, right, but for their life history traits overall. So if you look at this little diagram right here, you'll see that things like photo period, rainfall, temperature, play an active role through the brain, then through the hormonal system, into reproductive behaviors, which leads us into the actual reproductive schedule. So as you saw in that previous slide, temperature is one of those important environmental factors of reproduction, and it can actually influence a variety of reproductive events in the schedule. So something like the timing of nesting. And we can actually see this here in the loggerhead sea turtle. So this study right here was conducted from 1989 to 2003. Essentially, there was warmer sea surface temperatures throughout that time period. And you can see the median dueling day of nesting decreases. So sea turtles are nesting earlier in the year because of warmer temperatures. And of course, we want to know why, right? We know it's getting warmer and they're nesting earlier, but why? Why is, why is that flexibility beneficial for them? And what we think is it's because it's optimizing environmental conditions for the embryo and for the hatchling. So if you have more of a hatchling success, then you will have a higher maternal fitness as well. But of course, we're at a go for tour this conference where we're not going to talk about sea turtles. So a little bit on their reproductive schedule. They are like essentially a lot of the other summer turtles in the United States. So you see breeding in spring and fall, nesting in the summer. Now, Specifically, we see breeding in March through October, with a single clutch of eggs laid in March through June. Obviously, we care about reproductive ecology because, as you guys can see right here, we do have them federally listed as threatened. In Florida, we have them state listed. So knowing that ecology is important for management. Now, how do we actually know those states, right? How do we study reproductive behavior? Well, we've done it essentially in the northern part of the range, so things like North Florida and Georgia. Unfortunately, we don't know much in the southern range, and we don't know even less, essentially, under this frost line. So, anything below here, and this is where our study site was, it's a maple. Anything below here, you don't have the ground freezing, and you won't essentially have hibernation, while up here in North Florida and in Georgia, we know that the gopher tortoises hibernate. So, in recent years, we've been seeing more of a trend of people saying, yes, yeah, southwest Florida and all of southern Florida is different, right? We're warmer, obviously, we all know that by the study outside. But we're saying that a lot of our reptiles are acting differently as well. And more in 2009 suggested that maybe gopher tortoises are breeding year-round in Florida. And this table right here is actually from our study site showing you courtship, so things like head bobbing are occurring in every month of the year and mating, at least in terms of um, seeing them mount one another, was seen in these months right here, which if you know, are actually your winter colder months when you would expect for an activity to occur. Now, this is your typical um, essentially mating or mounting event, right? Nothing too crazy about that. It's a little bit of G, I guess, but that's what it is. Now, what is unique about this is that this was actually taken in February, right? So February is a very cold month, supposedly. It's supposed to be an active period for the gopher tortoise, but obviously not in southwest Florida. Now, those months 
And those dates that we have are given through hormone profiles. So essentially, testosterone, estradiol, and progesterone are telling us when these reproductive events occur. Now, all of this information right here comes from a study published in 2000 from a northern population. If you can see, it's only May through October. So we're not really given anything on November through March. Obviously, here, it was an inactive period. It was hibernation, um, and it wasn't looked upon. So we wanted to fill that gap by essentially looking at it in southwest Florida, but looking at it for a full year and doing it on a wild population, which has yet to be done essentially until now for the gopher tortoise. Now, those hormones that I just mentioned, why do we look at them, right? Why do they tell us things about reproduction? Essentially, it's because they're attributed to specific key events in our reproductive schedule. So testosterone is important for spermatogenesis and maintenance of sperm. So essentially, a peak in T will indicate spermatogenesis and mating. In females, it's a precursor to follicular development, which we won't go into too much since we're not comparing that to the northern population. Estradiol triggers the telogenesis, so essentially making and moving those yolk nutrients into the growing follicle. So a peak in T is associated with the telogenesis. And then progesterone is ovulation. So when you see a peak in P, right after you know that ovulation is occurring, fertilization and nesting. And all of this is the data from up there in the northern part of the range. So really quick, before we get to the results, what, how we actually went about doing this was collecting three milliliters of blood per sample within five minutes of, of capture of the individual to reduce stress and things like testosterone. Now we did this for five males and five females monthly, obviously not the same ones every time. We would go and find them genetically from July 2016 through June 2017. The blood was then centrifuged and the, the separated five miles put on dry ice put in a freezer, and then shipped off to Iowa State for radio and you know, assays at a colleague's lab. Now, we are going to go into um, the males and the females per hormone, but I do want you to follow along down here. Essentially, you're seeing that same kind of timeline that you saw on the northern population, but for ours. Now, testosterone, you see a high peak level from September through March. Now, I do want to mention really quick before I go into everything that our uh, hormone profiles were essentially run with ANOVAs. They did show significance, so then we went ahead and did the TP post hoc test. And when you see essentially the same letter, it's showing similarity. Now, we see, like I said, September through March, but then there's also a peak in June. So what we're seeing here is a bimodal distribution in that high testosterone level. So most likely spermatogenesis is in mating from September through March and maybe even into June. Now, female testosterone, like I said, follicular genesis, October through March is when you're going to see that peak, or you see down here. Now, this is important because it is similar to the E levels, and T can be aromatized into E, so that might be Y. And then we have estradiol. So you'll see it's elevated from August through April. And now, this is a very long period of time, essentially 9 out of the 12 months of the year, we're seeing really high follicular levels. Now, this is important, like we said, for those little proteins being high as the follicle, and then the follicles will grow. This is obviously a much more extended time period than what we saw in north. And our last hormone is progesterone. And you can see off of this lovely diagram that I made that you have that F follicle being released from the ovary, it can then be fertilized, and you have nesting occur. Now, this is what I find very interesting. Hopefully, you'll see it should um, come out to you as well. We have two peaks in progesterone, so we have a peak in November and a peak in about March, so that February to April period. So what we're suggesting is that maybe nesting can occur from November to March, but given that these are such high levels, what we're actually thinking is that there may be actually two, uh, two nesting events occurring throughout the year. Now, Producing more than one clutch of, of eggs a year and having a very long um, and elevated estradiol level is more indicative of a tropical turtle over a temperate turtle. So we have seen other turtles who have that extended E, who have more than one clutch. It's... Can you just change oh, the handle? I have no idea. It could be interference from someone. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Sorry about that. Does that work? Okay, turn on the mic there. Sorry. Sorry. No, yeah, it's okay. interfering with something. All right, perfect. So what we're thinking is this is more of a tropical response. So obviously, as any good scientist, right, you're going to ask me, well, is it plasticity or is it an adaptation? And truth be told, I can't tell you concretely what that is. 
but we're thinking it's more of a plastic response to that subtropical condition because of what we know about temperature. And obviously this response has been seen in a couple of other turtles, so that's kind of where we're leaning. But in the grand scheme of things, what we're showing is that if you see, this is our mating, okay? Now it's going to get a bit complicated, but essentially that light pink is um, everything that we saw for females here specifically. When it's hot pink, it's an overlap. So we saw the telogenin in both uh, cycles happening here in the north and south, here in the north and south. This was only in the northern population. And then if you look at the blue, this is our mating, and this is overlap when it's that aqua color, and this dark blue is just in the northern population. So what you should be seeing is essentially the telogenesis occurs for much longer. In the south, we have two nesting events, and then spermatogenesis and mating are shifted into these typically inactive winter months, right? And, as, and knowing uh, gopher tortoise work here in Southwest Florida, I'm sure that you know that it gets extremely hot in the summer. When you're out in the field, we see a lot less tortoises active in those summer months compared to the winter months. So we're thinking that's driving that change in mating and reproduction in Southwest Florida. Of course, in even bigger pictures, what do we actually do with this information, right? It's great to know that they're doing different things in Southwest Florida, but what we would argue is that we should maybe think about management more regionally for the gopher tortoise. So not just moving them within the same uh, state, or, but thinking about maybe those east to west margins, especially given that recently we've seen that there are unique haplotypes in Southwest Florida. So we really want to um, keep that genetic intraspecific uh, diversity for the species. And hopefully we can um, argue that with these results. And with that, I'd like to give a big thanks to every single lab member that came out with me. As you can see, it gets pretty hot out in the field. And my funding sources, but also my research advisor, and then Jordan Danini, who also helped us out with a lot of the methodology. And that's it.